in my opinion, pre to the free 2050, for it to be successful, we need tools that don't burn the community's energy and trust. And it's tools like this, and we're going to need better tools than this to get there. So this is probably one of the first ones to, to, to get us in the right direction. And the old school way of trapping with the kill traps, I think, does burn energy. We're the only ones doing this in a, in a community way and, and learning quite quickly how to keep landowners in the game. Real measure of um, of the possum eradication when you start seeing koe koe coming up like this everywhere, and all the big trees surviving. It's um, it's a sure sign. The, the possums love this stuff. The fresh leaves, they just eat like it's fresh fresh lettuce. I grew up in the area on a on a deer farm. In fact, it was an old McDonald's farm. Uh, we we had our possum problems and our pest problems like everyone else, and we we did a lot to try to get on top of that, but, but never could. I ended up offshore for, for 12 years in Europe um, and would come back periodically. But when I moved back to here, we, we purchased this property and were stunned by the bird life, the sheer amount of bird life, which was nothing like I'd seen when I was, when I was growing up. And had no idea why it was the case. It had bush blocks just like the farm we, we grew up on. Um, but we, we counted 12 kedadu in the, in the Pahutakawa tree by the house here, uh, one of the first mornings we were here, and, it, and that was a, a massive change. Seeing one or two was a big deal at the, when I was growing up. Um, but what it turned out to, to be was there was a TB outbreak here and, and an eradication uh, approximately five years before and these valleys were, were 1080 because of the steepness of them, but the rest of the valleys and bush blocks were manually cleared out with bait stations and shooting. Uh, so, so these valleys in particular had really low rat numbers and there were no possums here. Uh, it was probably another three or four years, so maybe eight years after the eradication that the possums started to show up and w within a couple of years they were showing up in big numbers to the point where well, we did a, a, a clear out in, in the valleys just south of here and we were shooting 40 a night. Um, so they, they came back quickly uh, and once we learned why the possums weren't here and why the, the bird life was so high it suddenly became obvious that we, <laughs> we, we should be maintaining the winds that we already had. So. So we, we started looking into ways to clear the bush blocks again, so through trapping and bait stations, and quickly found that the maintenance involved was huge. Um, there was no way that that my family and I could could do it on our own across all these bush blocks, so it really needed landowner involvement. And the landowners weren't prepared to put that much effort in, and, and these are farms, and it's, the, it's, it's obvious they're not going to do that. It doesn't. There's no profit in it for, for them. So, so the benefits are small, but the maintenance is really high. So, so we we looked at better ways of doing things. Bait stations obviously had a um, a huge impact quite quickly, but it's putting toxins into the environment, which we're not so happy about. Uh, so we were looking at other options, and uh, Trap.NZ was one of the first things we clocked onto that we could start mapping out what we've got and that way we can communicate with the, the local landowners about the efforts that were happening, get some collaboration, get us all working at the same time uh, and, and then we felt like we could get on top of things. And the quick learning from that was that not a lot of effort was, was being put in or it was being put, on, put in on certain farms and not others and at different times of the year and at different levels and, and that's fine for control but it's no good for eradication. Eradication is about getting the last one. Uh, so that, that needs a s significantly more coordinated effort. Uh, so, so that's where the uh, trap.nz and, and things like the remote monitoring and the, uh, and the automatic lure dispensers start playing their role. I sit on the ops group for trap.nz which is the, the major pre to the free 
uh, operations in the country, so uh, Northland, Taranaki, Dunedin, uh, Miramar, so Prairie of the Free Wellington, uh, Auckland, and the Hawke's Bay. Uh, so these are guys that are using all the equipment and all the technology um, in an eradication sense. So they, they know their stuff, they know how to deal with communities, they, uh, they have all the, the problems that we have here on our small scale project. Um, so the, the methods we've come up with here are based on the learnings from these big projects and, and also the learnings from looking at the statistics across uh, Department of Conservation projects, uh, community projects, uh, large scale projects uh, like Pretty of the Free Franklin or Hawke's Bay. We have one of our rat bait stations down here, so rats and mice. Uh, so we have that marked on trap.nz. So every, every three or four months, ideally five times a year, we will top that up. coated uh, lure in there and, it, and we don't put much, it doesn't need much, this stuff generally doesn't doesn't go because we're on top of the rats. So the last time we put lure in it was 50 grams so that's down to about I don't know, 15 grams something like that uh, which we've left in there and we put say another 50 grams back in, press and hold the save button that'll turn green screen on here and then all the neighbours that are assigned to this one they'll also see on their system that it's uh, it's just been filled so we can work our way around this line and, and do these bait stations and we won't come back to that for another 90 days and with the rat number so low we could probably drop that back and do it three times a year which is what some projects do as well so before we were doing this people were People were losing track of when they'd done it. It might have been 18 months ago, and they were thinking it was six months ago. And uh, for pests, that's a pretty big window to be repopulating and, and breeding. Uh, so, so this way, everybody knows we can support each other. If one neighbour's away, that somebody else can do it for them. It's quick and easy to do, and it, it keeps them in the loop. So it's a really cool collaboration tool. So we'll head on down. We've got a fill-proof bait station here, which is for possums and, and rodents. And actually that's that's still full, so we'll leave that. It's looking a little bit mildly on it, so we might have to come back at some point to clear that one up. But for the moment, we can mark that. There's bait remaining, 100 grams, don't remove none. And we'll leave that as it is, because that's going to need a proper servicing. But earlier than bring the bag down to, to remove it, to leave it the way it is. So this is a pin strap, possum kill trap. They're really labour intensive and today I've forgotten to bring the lure for it so it'll just sit there without any lure in it until the next time I get down here. If I remember to come then yeah I'll, I'll do it but it's, it's kind of not reality for a, certainly for a farmer or for a person where this is just recreation. So getting, keeping these serviced is, is really high maintenance. For eradication, that's, that's the big problem, is that that will sit there for, for weeks, if not months. We already know that live capture techniques, so cages and leg holds, uh, get a much better catch rate, um, up to 10, potentially even 15 times, depending on, on the, the circumstances, um, how often they're maintained, etc. So this is, this is what we're using here locally. And we, we use these rather than leg holds uh, so that we can keep animals safe. Um, nobody wants to see a, a pet cat get caught in, in a leg hold and come back with a maimed leg. Uh, so, so this will keep a, a domestic cat or a dog or a chicken or whatever, a, a kiwi. Um, it'll keep it safely in there for the night. We use remote monitoring on them so that all the landowners who are assigned to a particular trap, they'll know instantly that the trap has gone off and there's something in there that needs to be released. Uh, so that keeps the, uh, the animal safe. It means that the trap is armed every night of the year. Uh, whereas with one of these, if you catch an animal, uh, it, it will be out of action until you clear that animal and relure it. And, and depending on your maintenance schedule, that could be weeks, months. These ones, it relures itself every night. Um, these ones are using a, a zip motor lure. 
after we make up our own mayonnaise concoctions with salmon oil and uh, rabbit oil. Uh, this one's actually got a chicken flavouring in it and that'll put a drop down onto that tray every night and, and one fill of mayonnaise will last 10 months so it costs us less than two dollars for 10 months worth of consistent trapping. So it's an absolute win, that thing is catching animals every night and if you get a group of animals in, in one area they'll be visiting that every night. If their friend gets caught in it they'll be coming back the next night to work out where they've gone. Um, so you can clear an area up really quickly with those but but yeah, with these ones, if you only got one trap there, then you're only going to get one out of that, that pool of animals. So, uh, so this is an absolute win. Um, the other nice thing about it is that you can leave that set for months at a time, knowing that it's doing its work, knowing it'll tell you when it's gone off, but there's no maintenance. Once you get the animal numbers down, the maintenance goes down accordingly. But with these things, if you're having to relure and check these things every week or every two weeks that maintenance level stays the same despite not catching anything and that's a real motivational killer if you're paid to do it for example if you're a dock contractor then that's absolutely fine you've got no problem with checking empty traps but as a farmer or a landowner then that's really affecting your bottom line for for no uh, deemed benefit pretty the free franklin are making these ones um we we're making them ourselves because there's a few design decisions in here that you, you're not going to get off uh, the, the run of the mill. Uh, this one has a finer mesh which will hold uh, stoats and uh, weasels. Uh, we've found with the earlier versions we had with the larger mesh it didn't hold them so we're having these things go off for no catch and the moment we put one of these out we, we caught a stoat. The monitoring systems are produced by Veronet, which is a company in Onifedo, who are an internet service provider, but they were also using this technology to monitor their own beehives. Uh, once we, we spoke to them locally, we quickly understood that they had a solution that would work for, for remote monitored traps. Uh, so together with Veronet we've developed the, the system which integrates with the existing trap.nz system. Um, and you could potentially use these on anything, use them on, on gates for monitoring gates, for using for atmospheric monitoring etc. But these ones have been specifically designed and built to meet the requirements of the Animal Welfare Act um, for, for live capture. Uh, so the, these are available from Ferronet um, or you can contact uh, Bread of the Free Franklin and, and supply these. And you can use these on, on any particular trap, it doesn't need to be live capture. You can attach them to to a Dock 250 or a, or a Tim's trap or, or what have you, and, and they will tell you the same information. So that will sit there, dropping mayonnaise, and, and mice might be coming through and cleaning it up every night. Uh, insects might be coming through and cleaning it up every night, but you know that there will still be that residual scent from the night before so it's always got scent in there we're not feeding the animals all we want to do is get them in there to investigate that so let's say an animal walks in follows the scent tra trail through there stands on stands on that that sensor will then send a message back to trap.nz uh, which will send emails out to all the people who are assigned to this and you can have multiple people or just one person if you like it's a good idea to have multiple so you can back each other up <laughs> The Animal Welfare Act says that that thing, if it's been triggered, needs to be cleared within 12 hours of daylight. So somebody needs to be going to that, that trap. So there is, a, there is a burden that comes with them. So let's say you're on holiday or you're too busy with carving or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, at least you know and you can then ask a neighbour, a friend, family member, whoever, to, to come and clear it for you. So that's where the whole collaboration part of it, where the technology really comes in and, and lets you work within the legislation and, and do what's best for your, your, your pest control. And we've done the numbers on, on monitored traps versus uh, non-monitored traps. And using it without the monitor and the auto lure uh, is the most expensive way you can possibly trap because legally you need to go to that trap every single day. So that means that you're only really going to use it in the orchard or next to the, to the milking shed because those are the places that you can check without putting extra effort in. So you wouldn't think about using one of these in a remote bush block uh, unless you had that gear. So 
So now that we have that gear, we can we can have these everywhere, and and that's what we've done here at Fitty Fitty. We have them. Uh, we have nearly 40 of these things spread out out over a few thousand hectares. Once the phone goes beep, you'll know about it. Everyone will know about it at 6 a.m. in the morning. We can come into here, check which one it was, make a plan between us who's going to go and clear that trap, add your record in here, and then get back on with your day, your farming, whatever you need to do. The cost of maintenance on one of these things is really minimal. Once you buy the unit, the whole remote monitoring side of things happens through Trap.NZ and that's that's free. Uh, so battery replacement in one of these things is roughly every three to five years. Uh, the motor lure, we don't know yet, something like eight to ten years is the expectation. So those batteries are something like five dollars for one of those every three or so years and for these things maybe twenty dollars every eight to ten years and then the mayonnaise is say two dollars a year uh, so it's exceptionally cheap trapping uh, the labor involved in it once you get the, the pest numbers down you might only be catching an animal every two or three months uh, so that's one visit to these you know, 15 20 minutes turnaround uh, so that's that's about as cheap as you can go for getting rid of pests especially the big ones like your, your feral cats possums ferrets so it's um it's an absolute win for farmers. There are other automated tools out there, but they are species specific, generally. Uh, there's there's tree-mounted uh, auto traps, which will take out possums, perhaps a mustelid, uh, certainly rats and mice, uh, but they're, they're not going to get you your feral cats and your ferrets and your Norway rats. Uh, so, so this is a win from the multi-species perspective. There's still a bit of maintenance involved with these, which you wouldn't get with a uh, with an automatic trap. Um, but those are kill traps, so you don't get the coverage for um, or the safety coverage for cats and kiwi and and the species you're actually trying to protect, uh, which is what you'll get out of one of these. So really, it's a combination of all these tools that's going to get us there. Um, but if you're going to have just the one tool, that would that would be a winner for the for the farmers. And there's plenty of challenges. Uh, I, was, I was told at the outset of this, and I, I don't come from an ecological background or a pest control background, but I was told uh, uh, pretty the free New Zealand is a people problem. It's not an animal problem. And, and when you first start thinking about it, you know, that kind of doesn't make sense. But you but you soon find that out, and uh, dealing with landowners is, is, is great, you, but they've all got different opinions on what, what Credit the Free 2050 or Credit Free New Zealand is. They've got uh, different opinions on, on whether we should be doing, whether it's possible or not. Uh, some of them think they're, they're doing eradication work when really they're doing the barest control work. So the big difference between pest control and pest eradication. So getting that across to people is, is hard work. So, And a lot of it is an emotional challenge. Uh, yeah, people don't have the time to discuss details and stats and, and look into to it too deeply. So they, they'll make gut instincts on things. So that's our challenge is to, to get the information across and provide the tools in ways that, that, um, that don't upset people. One big ch challenge that recently came up was, uh, was land access. Um, people read too much into what, what we're, we're trying to do or what Predator 3 2050 is. So for, for these things to work it needs a, potentially a number of people to be operating a, a trap so that means land access and, and not every farmer is happy with, with other people walking over their land. So, so we, we've got challenges there to overcome. Um, it really needs farmers to work with us and to give us feedback on how to overcome those. Um, they're part of the solution, so we, so we need that open dialogue constantly to, to work out the ways to, to make the systems work. Certainly for possums and potentially ferrets, it's a, it's a short-term game. We might be rid of them within three or four years. So it's, uh, it's worth having that dialogue the more dialogue we have, the faster we can get there.
If you want one of these things, you can have a look at the Predator Free Franklin website. Uh, they're listed on there, or get in contact with us and uh, we can talk about how to get you some. Uh, one of the crucial things is having LoRaWAN coverage. So LoRaWAN is an Internet of Things network. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a gateway and aerial near you, you'd need to get one of those put in. Across Franklin, we've got them everywhere, so it's fairly rare to find a spot where one of these things won't work. Um, but we can work with anybody to get one of those in. Um, and across the country, there's more and more gateways going in, so, uh, so it's either a matter of purchasing one yourself or talking to us and we can let you know how to, how to get that arranged. If you purchase one of these traps, the first thing you, you want to do is to register on this system. So you jump onto the trap.nz app, use the center button to locate you. So this is us in, in my backyard. You hit the install button and you can correct the location. I'm going to install a trap. I'm going to call this one page 1037 and it is a smart cage. The mark that it has a sensor and the provider is Theronet and the code is 1037. I'm going to take a photo of it so we know where it is. Press and hold the save button. So that's on the system now. And it takes a uh, few minutes for the message to come through and once that first message comes in that will register on the system and then we can and if you heard that beep that sent a message off and that will come back via trap.nz shortly and we can check all of our traps and fitty fitty here so we have one on a dock 200 which has been triggered and we have a Page, which is just up the road with a neighbour which has also been triggered and the rest of them are all sitting there armed and active. So this is a tool that's mostly for use uh, in rural areas, there's no reason you couldn't use them in town. The urban possum is, is very definitely a thing and uh, most people would be surprised how many mustelids there are in, in town as well. You'll quickly catch the neighbour's cat uh, so you'll need a conversation with your, your neighbour, uh, potentially discuss putting collars on cats so that it's easy for them to, to know who's, who the cat belongs to, or, and certainly make sure it's chipped. Uh, so cat, cats would be the main issue using them in town, but there's absolutely no reason you, you couldn't use them in town. Uh, urban pests are very much present. Have a look at projects like Miramar, uh, which is aiming to be predator free. Uh, they're, they're still getting the last of the, the, the rats out of Miramar, but they're, they're very close and the, uh, the bird life that has come back there is, is now phenomenal. Uh, so they've used a combination of mostly bait stations, but trapping as well, which is both contractor based and community based. Um, so places like the, the estuaries here in Waiuku, uh, yeah, those places we should very definitely be, be trapping and baiting and there are already community groups doing that uh, through Waiuku. Uh, and anecdotally, the, uh, the shorebird life down at Sandspit is really good from, from doing that work. So. And it's not only there, all around the Manukau, there's community groups doing shoreline trapping. So that all, that all feeds into the birds that are arriving in, in Waiuku. So yeah, abs absolutely, if you're in Waiuki living on the shoreline there, uh, there are Norway rats and ship rats everywhere, so yeah, get involved. If you jump onto the predatorfreefranklin.nz website, there's a big map uh, which shows you the community activity, shows you what, what, what pests are being caught and the trap density around the area, and it also gives you links to, to those projects so that you can join. Uh, so you register on there and somebody will be in touch with how, how you can help out and how you can trap it at home as well. Increasingly, other, other areas are using this sort of gear, um, and successfully so. And, and some projects have done for a long time. Department of Conservation projects have, have used this gear for a long time, but they've often been targeting one specific species, and they'll do it for a short period of time, whereas we're looking at, say, 10 years' worth of this gear. 
and who knows, this could, gear could be out here till, till 2050, doing its thing and just keeping the, the pest levels low. Um, and if that's all we come out of it with, a way to, to let landowners keep animals down at that 2% level, we'll, we will see the biodiversity outcomes are after and, the, and people will be happy, as long as they're not putting too much effort into it. So, so through here, used to be, used to be the track when we first started the project, I used to walk through here, the kids and I would walk through here to set up the bait stations and traps. But this is all regrowth in the last five years. The only thing that's changed in here is, is the lack of possums and the lack of rats. Uh, so, so this is what happens. And you can see the growth coming away every year through here, Tarairi coming away. Um, so it makes a big difference. It's a whole new, whole new layer of forest coming away. We've had very few possums for probably probably three years now and the catch rates are, are getting smaller and smaller but the things we start to notice now is, is things like koe koe coming up like this and it, it's everywhere, all the koe koe trees are, are just full with this lush bright green leaf. Uh, if you go to somewhere with a lot of possums you just don't see that, they're stripped bare, you don't see them growing at, at this level so it's a really good indicator that you've got rid of your possums. Yeah, it's, it's neat once it so every couple of years it'll uh, it has seed pods that hang down and they they almost like grapes big green uh, seed pods and when they open up they kind of open up into three segments and then in the middle of that is these bright orange seeds like fluorescent orange and and not many people have seen them the neighbors here have sent me photos of them saying what on earth is this and uh, it's really nice to say, well, all that effort you've put in, that, that's one of the things you get out of it. Um, so yeah, the possums love those seeds as well. And this is, this is the type of thing I love seeing. You come down into these bush blocks and five years ago, we, we, we didn't have growth coming away like this. It was all nipped off. Um, the only thing that's changed in, in these bush blocks is getting rid of the the rats and the possums. And these have been fenced off 30, 40 years. We're seeing this, this change constantly as a generation comes through. All of this, all of this regrowth here, this wasn't here five years ago. Um, so yeah, the five finger pseudopanic is, all oh, these are king fern, which will grow huge. You know, this one's, reasonable but they'll get bigger than this again and these things are in national decline it's quite rare to find these things and they're as healthy as anything and, and these are coming away all through these bush blocks look on the other side there they're everywhere now so so yeah really really cool to see this happening and the same through here all of us having to push through king ferns is a, is a new experience through this but A lot of people are making the point now that replanting trees is fantastic, we should all be doing that. But this is equally as important because when you look at the number of trees that are coming away here, plus the bird life as well, and for a farmer getting rid of the, uh, getting rid of the pests, the disease issues, etc., then, then this is a win across the board, just getting rid of pests and the, the difference it makes. So. New Zealand being predator free will be done bit by bit and I think increasingly we're we're thinking that success will look like areas like this that have boundaries like the Aroa stream, the Waikato River, the coast, and calling those areas predator free or at least one of the predators uh, being eradicated is, is a form of success. So for predator free Franklin, I, I think we're leaving that definition up to, uh, to the land, the people doing the trapping. They'll define what that, that success is, but for us, just eradicating one pest and, and motivating people to give it a go, I think, is a success for us. So we're now three years into using this type of thing. Uh, we're 18 months into using it at scale, and we saw an instant uh, spike in, in all of our graphs and catch rates and now we're seeing 
those catch rates really drop off as the pest numbers are, have got right down. All the animals that we just couldn't get through shooting or bait stations, we're, we're now cleaning up with these. And we're watching the maintenance come down as well, so, so farmers are getting back to their farming. And, and we can start to relax as, as coordinators. And we don't have any paid coordinators here, uh, and we don't need them. Um, so the network of, of this gear out there and, and using collaborative tools that are free to use, we're, we're finding that we can do what was nearly impossible five years ago. So it's, it's real project Chris and um, we're really proud of it. And they've now become our best monitoring tool. If there's re-incursions anywhere, we'll know about it pretty quickly because they'll end up in, in one of these things. Uh, and there's, un unless you've got somebody out there with a spotlight every night or cameras that somebody is going to check, which just doesn't happen in this context, then you've got no way of knowing when you've got reinvasion. So this serves many purposes and monitoring is increasingly uh, one of those purposes. So. The end goal is an interesting one. Um, and it's clearly stated we're going to be pre to the free by 2050. And the chances of that are really remote. <laughs> Getting rid of the last rat by 2050 is, is, is near on impossible with, with current technology but getting rid of possums within that time frame with current technology should be really easy if we get everybody on board. So what is success? What does that look like? I, I think getting rid of just one of those species is success in itself and finding out how big the, the rest of the problem is and finding routes to, to solving those is also success. So it looks different to everybody but I think giving it a go takes us so far forward that that is success in itself. If you're a landowner in Franklin and you want to get involved, the best thing to do is to jump onto the predatorfreefranklin.nz website where you'll find uh, the, the gear is available, all the how-to, uh, there's articles on, on how, to, how to use them best and you'll also see listed on there our hub days which you can attend. We have them once a month in Pukekohe and you can pick up the gear from there, uh, speak to us about it, uh, get all the know-how and uh, we'll get you all set up.